Without further ado, let us begin. It is my pleasure to introduce two esteemed speakers to officially open our Science of Learning National Summit this morning. Ross Fox has held senior positions in Catholic education across Australia, including Director in the Catholic Education Office in Melbourne and Executive Director with the National Catholic Education Commission, and in his part-time is a passionate supporter of the mighty Hawthorne Football Club. Dr. Jared Gaskin is the Executive Director of Catholic Education Tasmania. He has devoted his adult life to education, teaching in primary, secondary and tertiary settings and enjoyed senior leadership roles in four different Catholic education systems. We will hear from Ross Fox first and then we're going to hear from Dr. Jared Gaskin. Please make them very welcome. Thank you, colleagues. Things don't always go to plan. I was expecting my colleague, Dr. Jared Gaskin, to kick off things. I thought I'd have a few more minutes to compose my thoughts, but it's great to be here. There's such an energy in the room. Can I start just by saying congratulations for being here? There is nothing more important in my view in Australian education today than all of us, everyone involved in the noble craft of teaching, in the profession of teaching, to focus on what the science of learning means for student learning in our classrooms. Recently, I was uh, listening to a podcast with Dylan William and really the story I'm about to tell started with podcasts. Many of the people who are here today, um, listening to Lorraine Hammond, listening to Pamela Snow, listening to others through what I think is the best education podcast in Australia at the moment, could be superseded but Ollie Lovell's Education Research Reading Room. If you're not all listening to it, I'd certainly encourage you to skim the back catalogue because there's such great learning, particularly about the science of learning. And I was listening to this uh, podcast with Dylan William recently, and he said something that really caused for me a profound dis-ease as an educational leader. He said that the amount of research that links what happens in a classroom with what students know six weeks later is vanishingly small. The classroom in schools is treated as a black box, that we're obsessed with all sorts of things about structures of schooling, government funding, uh, all sorts of abstract concepts uh, that are remote from how students actually learn and how, as teachers, as educational leaders, we need to respond to the needs of students in their learning. So about uh, six years ago, um, I, I'd already been Director of Catholic Education in Canberra Goulburn for about a year, uh, and something very, very special happened. Uh, my first son, Jedediah, arrived. Uh, and I normally start with a, uh, a picture of me leaning over Jedediah's crib. He was about eight hours old um, and reading uh, Old MacDonald Had a Farm to Jed. Now, I did that because I felt at the time I needed to understand how children learnt to read. And I realised when I was doing that, um, I wasn't actually... The important thing wasn't really that I was reading to Jed. It was, of course, that I was exposing him to oral language, rich oral language. And I'm not someone who's really comfortable sitting, talking to myself with no evident response. So it was much easier for me to read a book to Jed, to a eight-hour-old child um, than to try and have a conversation. And it was that, and Jed this year has just started uh, primary school. He's just started it about to, as many children are, complete his first term of 13 years of schooling. He's now uh, one term through the million minutes of compulsory schooling that we will hopefully journey, him, journey with him on. And what we know in the science of learning uh, there was a recent article I was telling a few colleagues about in one of the online educational uh, magazines that claims the science of learning is far too ideological because we're concerned with efficient learning and effective learning. Now, I believe we should be really proud to be concerned with efficient learning and effective learning. I'm not sure what we should be offering in our classrooms and our schools that's not efficient and not effective. Because I know that if I went to my GP and she told me, I can make you better, but I, I'm not really interested in the most efficient way, let's, let's choose the way that takes longer um, and is more onerous on you. 
let's do that. Um, and I wouldn't be going to that GP for very much longer. And we shouldn't, um, as educators, be, be allowing inefficient learning to occur. And we know that there are so many challenges in realising that. So I'm just now going to try and find, this is the clicker over here. So uh, four years ago, our archdiocese launched a program that we named Catalyst. You can see that. It's about transforming lives through learning. We were trying to just capture what we think is the aspiration of every teacher, of every principal, of everyone who's involved in education. Uh, I work in Catholic education. I know that there are educators and colleagues from other systems and traditions. One of the things we're trying to do in Catholic education is make the transcendent imminent to students, to give them a sense that there's something bigger than themselves, that there's a, 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 a reality and an existence beyond their direct experience. But we want to make that transcendent imminent in their lives. So, and we believe firmly uh, in Catholic education in Canberra and Goulburn, we can do that through great learning and teaching, through offering our students an opportunity to acquire knowledge and then giving them opportunities to apply that knowledge in exciting and meaningful ways. We want the students to express their creativity, but it's probably true that's always and everywhere uh, through knowledge and after acquiring knowledge. And we know that's often neglected. So we, we started this journey we called Catalyst. And the, the starting premise, uh, which is I now have found is a little bit novel in education, is that, yes, students are very important, but the most important learner is the teacher. The most important learner is the teacher. And in Catholic Education, Camera Goldman, we're attempting to structure our system to reflect that belief, that the teacher is the most important learner. If we look after the learning needs of the teacher, the students will be very, very well look after, looked after in terms of their learning needs. And we reflected a lot on how we should express the aspiration uh, for our education system. And we came up with two, what we describe as the bold goals, just to give us a focus. And I'll, I'll reflect in a minute um, on the list of things that we think are the minimum set at the moment, guiding our work and our focus. But we started with these two uh, propositions, that every student is a competent reader. People are intensely uncomfortable with that statement because competency seems like a very, very low bar. They, they think that once we get a child to a certain reading level in grade two, we don't need to worry anymore. What we know, though, is that many things about a child's life chances can be correlated with their vocabulary and their reading ability when they graduate school and probably sooner, that we want through our education system, through a Catholic education in our archdiocese, to give students the opportunity to read books like Milton's Paradise Lost, like Clive James's Unreliable Memoirs, to make sense of it and to understand what it might mean for them, what it might mean for their lives and what it might mean for their place in the world. So we have profoundly high expectations about what it means to be a competent reader. Because we know uh, people like Harold Bloom say, the reason to read is to get to know yourself better, to get to deepen your understanding of humanity. That is the noble task of reading that we need to be able to offer to our students. So we know that the quicker that we can move students from learning to read to reading to learn, a whole world opens up to them through the literature that's available to them. And without being pessimistic, we have an incredible challenge as a society that reading in its long form of books might soon become a thing of the past because of all the pressures that we're experiencing. But I won't reflect more on that. So we're starting with that assumption, every child should be a competent reader as a result, by the way, of really good in-classroom instruction in the main. 
that we've come from instances in our own system, in many situations, we had half our students in intervention in terms of their early reading. Now, we know that the research is very clear that you should be able to achieve 90 to 95% of students achieving at expectation in terms of reading through great in-classroom instruction. And I believe that's why we're all here today. We believe that the tier one teaching, the in-classroom instruction, can be sufficient for the needs of most students. And we want to realise an education system where that's a reality. Because we, the sooner we can move those students from learning to read to reading to learn, they are on a path that they can dictate alongside their teachers. And we, cannot, uh, we can't begin to imagine what they might achieve uh, if they're able to achieve that. Then our second uh, bold goal was high impact teaching practice in every classroom. I spoke to a few colleagues last night. Um, there are too many classrooms in Australia that you can walk into and it's not evident that teaching is occurring. It's not evident that teaching is occurring. Now, we have fantastically trained educators, fantastically committed educators, and I know that many of them are here uh, uh, in the room today, but that challenge is that we need to make the most desperate, efficient use of our time for learning in the classroom. And that means that high impact teaching practice should be visible every classroom, every day, because we know that'll transform lives as we aspire to, and we share that belief as educators. So those are the two bold goals. Uh, we reflected a lot on pedagogy, curriculum and assessment. I won't talk in detail about those things today, but of course, our task as educators is to bring that experience together. And I have the modest aspiration that in the Archdiocese of Canberra and Goulburn, in the thousand classrooms that we have stewardship of, I want it to be as easy as possible to be a great teacher through things like, and Jordana Hunter's speaking, I think, later in the conference, providing really great resolved lesson plans and curriculum materials for lessons so that we can spend our time reflecting on how best to deliver the content, not making it up from scratch. So there's some great opportunities for us as a profession, as a system, to really ensure quality uh, and every teacher is supported to deliver great lessons every day. Now, I'll just quickly run through um, a few of these premises. Now, this is a, not necessarily a popular notion, but we believe, and our catalyst approach is based on these eight big ideas, that actually school is a place where we should learn things that students can't learn by themselves. And we should teach things that students can't learn by themselves in a very, very efficient way so that they can move on to the next thing that they can't learn by themselves. So school is so critical, and there are many things that students will learn by themselves. Speech is an obvious one, that we do not need compulsory schooling to teach speech, but obviously, if students need to develop exposure to richer vocabulary, school can have a great role in that. So we do need to focus on where schools can add value, and it's absolutely teaching biologically secondary information, not things that students will automatically learn. Of course, if they don't know them already, it's really important that we help them to learn that. Now, this is a profoundly controversial statement, I hope not in this room, but that we, we thought a lot about our definition of learning, what it meant to be learning, and we settled on this. Uh, I think it's from Kirshner. Dylan William has used it. Uh, it's used by a number of people. But really, learning is a change in long-term memory, and that premise set us to look very closely at cognitive load theory and what it meant for how we should approach effective learning and teaching in a classroom. Now, of course, a change in long-term memory is not everything that's valuable. But if you can't remember something, there's just an interesting question about whether you've learnt it. If it's not at your recall in your long-term memory, 
it's a really interesting question as to whether you can deploy that knowledge to help you solve a problem or uh, navigate a situation that's in front of you. So we believe this is a really powerful definition of learning that we need to constantly reflect on how it should inform our expectations in relation to pedagogy in the classroom. Now, it's hopefully no surprise here. Uh, evidence is highly contested. Uh, I, there's so many uh, sources or competing uh, ideas about evidence, and we're joined by the really the evidence guru today, Jenny Donovan, is going to be speaking up next uh, in so many ways. Um, my provocation also, in addition to this, of course we want to know the evidence, but if we can't express a chain of logic that says why this evidence would be meaningful, then the evidence is not worth thinking about until we've got clear the chain of logic that says, if this happens to a student, this is how they might learn from it. Um, but we absolutely need to be focused on uh, the evidence and how that informs our practice. Now, this is also slightly controversial, but teaching is actually about students ending up with knowledge about specific things. So I'm quite taken with the evidence and the discourse claiming that there are no such thing as domain general skills, that maybe there's only domain specific skills and therefore skills need to be learned through knowledge in a specific domain in a specific field. So knowledge really matters and we need to know that our teaching is conveying knowledge to the students. And I could say a lot more about that, by the way, but uh, if you haven't read E.D. Hirsch's Why Knowledge Matters, I'd really commend it to you. You don't need to read it cover to cover. There's this amazing uh, analysis of educational initiatives in France, which if you believe Hirsch's account, shows that a very generalised curriculum dramatically increases inequitable outcomes in an education system and lowers general performance. Uh, so I'd really commend E.D. Hirsch's Why Knowledge Matters uh, as a, a provocation in our work reflecting on what is really important in Knowledge Matters, because I think it's Dylan William who says, knowledge is what we think with, and student, the issue for students is often not that they don't have practice thinking, it's that they don't have enough knowledge to think with. And if we don't have a clear account as educational leaders of that question and an answer to it, then I think we're much the poorer. And uh, I hope this is not a controversial statement, but uh, it's not a popular conception widely held across the educational community in Australia, which is why this gathering is so important today under the initiative of Catholic Education in Tasmania, and we're so happy to collaborate it with, with that. But really, explicit teaching is, absent detailed evidence to the contrary, the most efficient way of acquiring new evidence, new knowledge for novice learners. That's so critical, and we have to pay attention to that and respond appropriately to that. So I'll finish in just a minute that our commitment has to be to our whole class instruction. Now, alongside a sophisticated and responsive intervention approach. But in many systems, in many schools, I know that a huge amount of effort is going into interventions at the expense of in-classroom instruction. I'm optimistic from what I've seen that we can make a profound difference to Australian education through the quality of in-classroom instruction. And we're seeing that across many of our schools, that things like behaviour are diminishing, behavioural issues are diminishing, uh, that we are able to lower the intervention need through great in-classroom instruction. And really, uh, as the bold goals have stated, reading is so critical. Now, I'm not saying for a moment that mathematics knowledge isn't critical. Mathematics learning isn't critical. There's all sorts of other things that we want students to know, but obviously reading as that core learning skill, we have to get right and we have to be assured that our in-classroom instruction will deliver that outcome for students. And that's what we need to be accountable for collectively and individually. 
And then, uh, unfortunately, in education, I'll just finish on this thought in one minute. Unfortunately, in education, there are many things that are calling us to a compliance mentality, to tick another box, to meet another standard. Uh, unfortunately, some of the policy constructs we work within do not guarantee that we can do what we're talking about in terms of high quality, effective instruction that's knowledge rich, that's low variance, that's sequential and coherent in our curriculum. The Australian curriculum is not sufficient to guarantee that, but we can achieve it within the Australian curriculum, we believe. There's quite a way to go in a number of policy areas in Australia to support the sort of high quality teaching, the high quality learning that we should aspire to. And curriculum is an area that we're gonna to continue to work on because we, we don't believe in the past our aspirations for the knowledge of students have been high enough that we, we can aim higher in terms of the sophistication of vocabulary, the conceptual understanding derived from the access to that knowledge and the potential of students is almost limitless as a result. So I, I just wanna say congratulations for being here. Congratulations for the leadership that you're, you're showing in your school, in your system. This is such a profoundly important conversation to be having. We've literally got Australian and world leaders talking to us uh, over today and tomorrow. Uh, I really wanna commend everybody's been involved in organizing it. Uh, this, this can uh, be the initiative that transforms education in Australia. I profoundly believe that, and the people in this room are a very much an important part of advancing that. And so I'll hand over to uh, Jared Gelvin, and congratulations, Jared, on your leadership and your initiative in bringing us together. Thank you. I think Thank it's you. only appropriate that I follow Ross because I've been doing that for the last year. Uh, we, um, most of you will know that the Inside Project grew naturally, logically and uh, psychologically and emotionally and pedagogically out of the work that we saw in Canberra Goulburn when we first visited in about June of last year. So we've had quite a, a, um, a breakneck journey and we've enjoyed every minute of it. And I want to take you on a bit of a breakneck journey as well uh, because... Um, I can see a timer here telling me exactly how long I've gone. Uh, and um, this journey is to, is to have a bit of a look at the history of ideas, um, the history of the way in which uh, education may have changed uh, in my lifetime in education, which is precisely 50 years. So 50 years ago this year, my wife Kathy and I turned up at Mercy Teachers College for our first year of training as teachers. So the title of my talk is uh, Rescuing Our Children from Failed Educational Theories. And that's not my title. It's actually part of the title of E.D. Hirsch's book, uh, Why Knowledge Matters, Rescuing Our Children from Failed Educational Theories. And I'm going to propose that we've been through a period of change here in Australia and probably in the Western world or the English-speaking world around... Um, uh, what we think good education is, what we think good pedagogy is, what's important in education, what are the building blocks of education, what are the essential without which we cannot uh, do the work of education. So if we're talking about failed educational theories, that's a fairly dramatic thing to say. And uh, Ross kind of apologised for being um, potentially controversial. Well, I promise I'm going to be more. Uh, the questions we have to ask about this proposal that there are some educational theories that have failed is what were they, why did they fail, and how can we do better? What's failed, why did it fail, and how can we do it better? So what has failed? Quote, education is a fashion industry. You may quote me. We're so easily influenced by... Uh, opinions about what we think is good education and of course more recently we've been really concerned to find the evidence, look for the evidence base on why we do what we do. In my 50 years in education I've seen a few fashions.
and it took me 30 seconds to make up this list. Two by 60 by 150 is the most amazing. So a senior leader in education in another part of Australia said, I asked him what his educational theory was. He said, two by 60 by 150. Two teachers, 60 students, 150 square metres. Now that is a recipe for purgatory. Absolute hell. I've been working in systems and talked to teachers about how it feels to be in that setting, if you like, to be compulsorily required to teach in that setting. And it does just about everything possible to take away any chance of a meaningful uh, edu educational relationship between the teacher and the student. So I'm going to argue that we have endured 50 years of experimental theories, 50 years of experimental education. There's the timeline from the beginning of the last century to now and beyond. It's been a period of constant change. It's been a period where curriculum rigour has been attenuated. And I can say that because when I became a young principal in Melbourne in 1982, the curriculum documents I was required to use were the size of a pamphlet. So the mass curriculum had all of the content, all of the stuff that we needed to know in primary school. Now, I think curriculum docu documents are measured by weight rather than by uh, quality. And unfortunately, we have the um, additional problem of the overlay of certain ideologies. Now, I think a curriculum is not a place for ideology. I think it's a place for ideas. It's a place for understanding, arranging, organising, interleaving knowledge because that's our job as educators, is to make sure that our students know things. In fact, make sure that our students know a lot of things. Just a quick tour through the centuries. I think it's fair to say that at the beginning of the 1900s, that we were confident and we agreed what good educational practice was. By the 1960s, we started using emerging technology. That's radio, ABC Children's Hour television, very early television, overhead projectors, gestetners. Does anyone remember the gestetner, that beautiful smell of alcohol in the morning <laughs> as, you, as you rolled off your purple masters of all your maths problems for the day? <laughs> I'm glad there's a few of you who remember it. <laughs> Maybe you were students rather than teachers at the time. It was also very good for cleaning, gestetner fluid was very good for cleaning graffiti off brick walls. Then we had this period of social and cultural upheaval uh, at the end of the 1960s. Then we started to disagree about what was a good pedagogy, what was good curriculum. We had the rise of experimental pedagogies, and you saw a list of some of the ones uh, in, in an earlier slide, and vanilla curriculum. I just love that expression. <laughs> the curriculum rigor slowly erodes, ideological overlays emerge, as we say. And we drift away from nouns to verbs. A curriculum that contains lots of nouns contains stuff to know. If you like, the currency of knowledge is vocabulary, it's words. And nouns are the most powerful words that we can use because they name persons, places, animals and things. Nouns describe and contain the content. Now, there's nothing wrong with a good adverb and I'm very happy with a conditional clause and an adjectival phrase just like the next man. But um, when we've got a curriculum that talks about lots of skills, lots of doing all the time, I think we've missed an important link, and that is that doing follows knowing. Uh, teachers begin to decline in confidence. We're being, we're being told that we're not the most important person, that the student controls all of the learning, and that's obviously true to a certain extent, but teachers started to apologise for being teachers. It's easy to fall into the trap of, oh, yes, I'm here to facilitate learning, I'm here to, in some way, guide, I'm the guide at the side and all the rest of it, the student's doing all the work. Well, I think the reality is the other way around. I think the teacher's got to be the one who does most of the work. The more work the teacher does, the more we're going to optimise learning for our students. And, of course, as we know from uh, national history, basically student achievement declines. And then we have the science of learning. We have a whole new, old way of understanding how people learn. Well, why did this failure that E.D. Hirsch talks about, why did it occur? Well, I can think of a few reasons. Certainly, it was the immense social and cultural revolution that occurred in the late 1960s. I mean, 
the Beatles broke up. <laughs> Woodstock occurred, the Vietnam War and, and its uh, aftermath. Martin Luther King was assassinated. John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Robert Kennedy was assassinated. And then there are certain ideological streams, and we can talk about this over, over lunch if you like. I won't go too deeply into it. But basically there was the rise of sentiment and revolution. So the sentiment, people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who during the time of the French Enlightenment wrote a book called The Emile. If you, if you haven't read it, it's, it's, interesting. it's an interesting read, talking about the child as the master. The, child, the naturalistic view of education, and E.D. Hirsch talks in great detail about that. The fact that um, all we really need to do is put the child into an environment rich in learning possibilities and then just hope that they'll learn. And then, of course, uh, Paolo Freire, the, uh, the Marxist, the, uh, I was going to say theologian, the Marxist philosopher who had a profound influence on education around the idea of constructivist learning and constructivist knowledge, that we each construct knowledge in our own particular way. And of course, we had this slow drift from science in education to fashion and passion, and from ideas to ideology. And educational practices itself went through a slow drift from something that's proven to something that's experimental. Now, you look at the two photographs there. And everyone says, so that's probably somewhere in the 1950s, the black and white photo. And everyone says, oh, well, you know, that's the problem. Education was dry and dusty and rote and we all sat in rows and all the rest of it. Now, my extreme scientific theory is that's because people think that because the photographs were all taken in black and white. So they're colourless. They don't convey the vibrancy of what really occurred. And I'm going to tell you what really occurred because I was there. That's my primary school. And in my primary school, I sat in a classroom with up to 60 students. The most efficient and effective teaching methods possible were used every single day. Explicit teaching, regular weekly topic testing, frequent book work to practice the newly acquired skills and to recapitulate what we'd already learnt. Class drills in spelling and multiplication. I still know my multiplication tables by heart, which means I can perform relatively complex mathematical operations in my head. We read and learnt Australian poetry, the Victorian readers, wonderful books that guaranteed that every student had a minimum level of culture, of literature, of poetry, British, Australian. I can still recite large tracts of Dorothea McKellar's uh, I Love It, My, my Country which doesn't start with I love a sunburned country, by the way. Um, we were familiar with The Loaded Dog, the stories of Henry Lawson, of Banjo Patterson. Our cultural immersion was quite substantial. I knew what a meridian of, uh, <coughs> of longitude was. I knew what a parallel of latitude was. I could pretty easily locate most of the uh, countries of the world on the globe. <coughs> um, we knew uh, all the figures of the Old Testament. We knew the great heroes of the Old Testament, of the New Testament. Um, we knew all sorts of things about the geography of Victoria. I knew the principal agriculture of the main regions of Victoria. That was just taught to me in primary school. The, the basic premise of primary school in my day, I can't believe I'm saying in my day, was that you would leave primary school with everything you needed to function in society. And that going to secondary school was the next exciting bit. But if we had equipped every student who leaves grade six with everything they needed to know to cope in, in uh, society, we were doing a wonderful job in education. My mother did her merit, so merit certificate was grade eight. She went to grade eight, and that's all she ever did in school. Now, uh, later generations have valued secondary education and all the rest of it. I tell you what, you'd be hard, hard pressed to con contest my mother on spelling or or tables, or what's the difference between an isthmus and a promontory and a peninsula, uh, and uh, all of the bits in between. So I don't think it's appropriate to denigrate what we did in the past, and, and I'm not suggesting that what we're doing here is doing a return to the past, but I think it's wrong to denigrate a system of education that was highly efficient, uh, extremely um, uh, uh, comprehensive and broad, and extremely uh, effective. Because the true measure of education is knowledge. 
The educated person knows things. And as uh, uh, Ross said and many have said, you, you, knowledge is what you think with. So how can we do better? Well, we need to think about how humans learn. I'm not going to take you through all of these because I was really keen to do a chat to the person next to you, share back to the group, check for understanding, but I don't think we have the time for that. Some basic concepts that we need to explore in order to understand the science of learning are some of these things. Teaching does not equal learning. What is teaching? I'd ask you to have a buzz, but we won't have time and we'll still be going at lunchtime. For me, teaching is showing, checking, practicing, checking, checking. Rosenshine's principles, the constant checks for understanding that are not window dressing, they're the integral components of learning. What's learning? 30 second buzz, we're still going. What's learning? Learning is seeing, hearing, practicing, asking, applying. Now this is obviously a lightning tour and the purpose of learning is knowing and doing and one follows the other. We can go into more detailed descriptions of learning. I won't bore you about, uh, with them at the moment. But what's the highest form of learning? And Ross uh, very much referred to this in his comments. The highest form of learning is an encounter with truth, with goodness, and with beauty. The ultimate things that we would want to know and we would want to learn and we would want to build into our curriculum are things that are true, things that are good, and things that are beautiful. Remembering is practicing learning. It's not hard. There's no rocket science. What I love about the science of learning is its elegant simplicity, the fact that we're able to capture in just a few words an understanding of what learning really is. Remembering is practicing learning and learning is not remembering and teaching is not learning and I think we need to be comfortable with understanding the distinction between those terms and teaching is not education and education is about gathering people, resources, cognitive effort, explicit content so that learning may occur for more than one person at a time. So systems of education such as ones that you all belong to in one way or another are there to organise people and resources and to organise cognitive effort so that more than one person can learn at a time. Clearly, there are essential components of education. And part of the problem with the period of experimentation that I talked about is that we can easily lose sight of the pillars, the essential components of what constitutes education. Clearly, the student, the teacher, the curriculum, and pedagogy. If we can get those four things right, and we have varying degrees of control over each of those things, then we are doing the work of education. We cannot leave any of those components out. So it's got to be the best teachers, it's got to be the best curriculum, and it's got to be the best, most efficient uh, pedagogy. Now, did we think of it ourselves? Absolutely not. The ancient Greeks were doing this work hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ. And they sought to understand the role of the senses, in particular, in learning. Uh, and, um, it's, and they designed a framework of subjects around this, and I'll just briefly dance through them. So they had already worked out key subjects and fields of knowledge that needed to be taught, and they were taught in the ancient world. So there was grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And don't feel limited by what our definition of grammar is right now. Grammar was all about knowing the content of the subject that you were studying. Logic was the ability to reason. So when we teach, if we're not engaging the use of reason, we're engaging in propaganda, not teaching. Because nobody can possibly learn without engaging the faculty of reason that ability to say, hang on a minute, I don't get that. I don't understand. Help me to understand that better. We must focus on engaging reason. There's nothing scary about it. The more our students start asking questions, the more we can be aware that they're learning. And then there were the four key subjects. 
Now, the ancient Greeks and Romans built an empire on these four subjects. Civilizations were built on this pattern of education. It's ancient and it's ever new. And you might like to reflect on just how little has actually changed in our thinking. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is epistemology, one of my favourite subjects. Can you imagine talking about that at a dinner party? <laughs> Pardon my epistemology. It's the study of how humans learn and know things. And all education is founded on an epistemological understanding of the human person and an epistemological understanding of how people learn. And we now know it as the science of learning. The deans for education uh, set themselves a task of trying to analyse the components of what constitutes good learning. Just take a brief second to read that description. It's straight out of their, 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 their work on the science of learning. If you were going to highlight some words in red, what would they be? Here are my highlights. The science of learning, which is the entire subject of our summit together, summarises cognitive science, how students learn for teaching. Now, there's a few words that we can fill into the middle, but that's pretty well uh, a simple short summary of what the science of learning is and what it aims to be. Then they came up with some beautiful graphics which uh, are very helpful and you notice that in all quality high impact teaching we make lots of use of lovely colourful symbols and graphics and try to create uh, lots and lots of dual coding. So here's the bit. Our lessons are sequenced and planned. They're not accidental. We put work into them. Now I'm practising this skill at the moment because I do some teaching of adult groups in our organisation. I have two screens on my desk. One's got my emails and my work and the other one's got the PowerPoint that I'm working on. And the PowerPoint is crafted carefully and lovingly. At what point am I going to do the checks for understanding? At what point am I going to do the pair shares? At what point am I going to ask my students to come back to me with the things that they do understand and the things that they don't understand? And I do put inordinate amounts of work into it, but it's so rewarding because when we do put the effort into our planning and preparation, we are much more effective as teachers. Minimising cognitive load, and you're going to hear a lot about this uh, during our conference together. Uh, we've only got a limited capacity in our brains to process new information and to somehow turn it into things that we've learnt or into memory. And the last thing we should be doing is loading up our cognitive capacity, our uh, working memory, with unnecessary things. A classic example would be, uh, and some education resembles this, would be to give a student all the parts of an old-fashioned clockwork alarm clock. Now, the student doesn't know what the alarm clock is or does. They've just got all the cogs and the wheels and the springs. Sometimes in education, we hand them the bag of parts and say, make something. And it's very unlikely that they'll come up with an alarm clock. But if we gave another student exactly the same set of cogs and springs and uh, framework and all the rest of it, and said, here's what an alarm clock looks like, here's how you put the cogs together to make it happen, then there'll probably be a much higher rate of success. The difference is between accidental learning and purposeful learning. We focus on reasoning, and I've already talked about that. That's a very important component of the science of learning. I'm here to argue for, thank you. I'm, thank you. <laughs> I'm here to argue for reasoning. We need, to, we need to engage the human capacity to think, to argue, to reason, to deepen our understanding. Practice, purpose, practice, practice, practice. And then there's feedback and check for understanding. Did you hear me? Feedback and check for understanding. Did you hear me? Feedback and check for understanding. Did you hear me? Feedback and check for understanding. The single most important tool I think that we need and that we should be using in uh, using the science of learning. And lastly, and not at all the least, is the relationship. The opportunity to build a relationship between the teacher and the student. 
in which learning will grow and flourish. Because for every student, the other person in the room is the teacher. And it's the interaction between the teacher and the student that engenders learning. It's the micro adjustments that the teacher makes all the way through the lesson to optimise the learning of the student. It's feeding back the responses of the student, all of which occurs best in a warm and friendly and safe environment. And so I'm happy to conclude by saying in all my years in education, I am absolutely convinced that the science of learning provides the best environment in which our students can learn. Can learn. It provides a knowledge-rich curriculum. It is based on Rosenshine's principles of instruction. It understands the limitations of cognitive load and its aim is to change the lives of our students, to give them the greatest gift we can give them, which is knowledge. Thank you. Thank you kindly to Dr. Jerry Gaskin and to Ross Fox.